Home is brought to you by New York Life and its over 10,000 agents and representatives who offer you quality financial products and services to help you get the most out of life. dressed for the beach, as well as the ball, to usher in the new era in Dolphin history, the long-awaited opening of Joe Robbie Stadium. Robbie's dream became a reality, and just in time to host Super Bowl 23 next January. Well, when you first went out in the pregame warm-up, uh, you looked around and you saw the new stadium, and, and it's beautiful. It really is state-of-the-art. Uh, it's a real credit to Joe Robbie. We got used to the Orange Bowl, and that was a good place for us, and hopefully we'll do some things that gets the fans excited to crowd with us in the new stadium, and we'll build some new mem uh, memories in the new stadium. Here's Marino back to throw, lost it downfield. Clayton is there. He's got it for a touchdown. Mark Clayton on the alley-oop. the snap, fires it wide open, Duper at the 45, gets to the 40, breaks a tackle, it's a foot race, he's going to score. No one reveled in the opening festivities more than the namesake of the new stadium. The Dolphins entertained the Chicago Bears in the stadium's first game. Congratulations to you, sir. This marked the culmination of three years of dedication and determination by Joe Robbie and provided a foundation for the future for the NFL's winningest team since the 1970 league merger, the Miami Dolphins. After a disappointing opening day loss in New England, the Dolphins rebounded against the future AFC East champions, the Indianapolis Colts. Miami looked solid on defense and spectacular on offense. Third and three from the 18. Here's the snap. Reno, quick pop, open and punt to Stratford. He's got a touchdown. His first in the NFL. All right, out of the shotgun. Marino on third down a long two. He fires. Touchdown at the goal line. Jim Jensen. Crash falls into the end zone with a crash. On second goal from the 10. Marino drops the throw. He fires. Caught at the five. Down to the two to one. Clayton gets in for the score. Mark Clayton gets the touchdown. His first of the year. Marino gets another three touchdown game. Miami earned its first win of the season and made it look easy. But for Don Shula, one of the toughest challenges of his coaching career was about to come as a new team of Dolphins took the field. It wasn't Marino at quarterback or Morrill wearing number 15, but rather a replacement player named Kyle Mackey. Mackey's tenacity characterized the Dolphin replacement squad, which displayed a fighting spirit despite last-minute losses to both Seattle and the Jets. Tied to 31 in overtime. Ryan sprints out to his right. He's looking, he's looking, he's looking. He throws. It is caught for a touchdown. And the Jets win it, 37 to 31. The first regular season game in Joe Robbie Stadium pitted the Miami replacements against their Kansas City counterparts, and the Dolphin defense exploded with some opening day fireworks. Here 
There's a handoff going to Smith, the fullback. Fumbles the ball, picked up. Down at the 40, 35, to the 30, down to the 20. This is Lifford Hotley, and he will score. Miami clobbered Kansas City 42 to nothing. And once the regulars return, the time was ripe for them to record a win in their new home as well. At the onset, it was the visiting Pittsburgh fans who had much to cheer about as the Steelers held a hefty halftime lead. But with Dan Marino at the helm, Miami is never out of a game. And the Dolphins proceeded to outscore Pittsburgh 28 to three. On the snap, drops straight back to throw. Good protection across the middle, caught by Duper. He may score, 25, 20, down to the 10, five, touchdown, Dolphins. 50 yards. Duper and Clayton, the wide receivers. Here's the play fake. Marino looks deep up the middle. He's got a man open at this front, and the 15, down to the 10. We get a touchdown for the Dolphins, and Mark Clayton is the guy who caught it. Made a great effort. Marino was marvelous, completing more than 80% of his passes and throwing four touchdowns. The Dolphins prevailed 35 to 24 and gave Don Shula his 250th regular season coaching victory. 1987 marked Don Shula's silver anniversary season, and after 25 years in the NFL, he remains the winningest active coach in the league, and he's second overall only to the legendary George Hallis. Shula also had the distinct pleasure of becoming the only coach to present two of his players for induction to the Pro Football Hall of Fame in the same year. Well, one of the side benefits of coaching is to be able to enjoy the recognition that's given to your players. Here to present Larry Sanka, the superstar fullback of those Dolphin teams, is his coach, Don Shula. Two of the guys that uh, finally are getting recognition, Larry Zonk and Jim Langer. And to be part of that ceremony uh, just makes it so much more worthwhile. To be there when their families are there and they are uh, given that recognition and to be able to share in the enjoyment that they experience that day is uh, what coaching is all about. Shula's success is also a reflection of his fine staff of assistant coaches. On offense, he relies on assistant head coach David Shula, offensive line coach John Sandusky, and Carl Tassif, who oversees the offensive backs. Fiery Tom Olivadotti, along with linebacker coach Chuck Studley, defensive line specialist Dan Sakanovich, and defensive backs assistant Mel Phillips have their work cut out for them on defense. In the last few years, we've been just patchwork defense. We haven't been able to put the people on the field that we're pleased with and then let them play together. Injuries and inexperience hampered the Dolphin defense in 1987, but there is great promise for the future in young players like Rick Graff, number 58. <laughs> Sophomore defensive end T.J. Turner, number 95, led the team in sacks. He was followed by number 70, linemate Brian Soche. Former top draft pick Jackie Schiff had his best season as he led Miami in tackles. Mark Brown provided consistency from his linebacker position. And David Fry, number 53, added depth to the unit. The defense worked together to create turnovers. Here, Bob Brzezinski forces the fumble, and cornerback Paul Lankford recovers. Rounding out the defensive backfield were William Judson, Bud Brown, Don McNeil, and Mike Smith. Lankford tied for the interception lead with Glenn Blackwood, whose season abruptly ended with a serious knee injury. When the season opened, star linebacker John Offerdahl was lost with a bicep injury. But once he returned to the lineup, so did the spark of the Dolphin defense.
Despite playing in only nine games, Offerdahl was second on the team in tackles and made his second straight Pro Bowl. Offerdahl showed no signs of a sophomore slump after a spectacular rookie year. In 1987, the same lofty expectations were held for number one draft pick John Boza. The defensive end had a rocky start, but once he grasped the system, he showed the potential that could make him the impact player up front that Offerdahl was in the linebacking core. Number 97 could be the tonic for the anemic Dolphin pass rush. John Boza epitomized the youth and enthusiasm of the Dolphin defense. Although still a few players away, they've laid the foundation for the future. When Dan Marino met Boomer Esiason in the ninth week of the season, an aerial duel was expected as two of the league's premier offenses clashed. But each quarterback tossed only one touchdown pass, and when the game went down to the wire, the biggest play was the one that wasn't caught, rather than the one that was. The only Hail Mary said on this day were ones of relief by Dolphin defenders as they preserved a 20 to 14 victory. Two weeks later in Dallas, the score was the same, but it was a much different story. Marino again threw for the game-clinching score, this time to James Pruitt. But a new chapter in Dolphin history was opened as Troy Stratford burst into prominence. The fourth round draft pick out of Boston College rushed for 169 yards against Dallas, the most by a Dolphin in a decade. En route to amassing 200 52 total yards, third best in team history. Stratford the only back, and he is to Marino's left side from the 46. Marino deep drop, wants to throw it. It is caught in the middle of the field, 45-40. Stratford to the 30, 25, to the 20. And what a ball game this guy is having. Down to the 20-yard line, he goes. Again, running wild in that uh, Dallas secondary. Marino gives to Stratford outside of the left. He cuts the corner. He gets to the 50. He's down to the 45. He is almost in the open. He's being pushed upfield to the 25, down to the 20. 20-yard line as the Cowboys were trying to strip him of the football. And that time, he just uh, was like a little bull out there, refused to be stopped. Came off to Stratford, tries to run to the left side, cuts it outside to 15, down to the 10, down to the 5, he's in for the touchdown. Stratford was named AFC Offensive Player of the Week for his heroics in Dallas, just a preview of many accolades to come. In 1987, the Miami Dolphins heralded the return of their running game, all wrapped up in a pint-sized yet powerful package wearing number 23, Rookie of the Year, Troy Stratford. We had some big games last year in critical situations for us. He's ready to, to blossom. The guy is a tireless worker. We're just going to have to give him the football, and he's also a good receiver coming out of the backfield. His upper body's going to his right and his lower body's going to the left and, and you're trying to get somewhere in between on him, you know. The guy is just a scrappy little guy, he's so quick. But not only is he scrappy, but he knows how to use his leverage to get the extra yardage. He knows when to jump, when to get down, you know, when to go right, when to go left. So, yeah, I tell you, I hit him a few times and I'm 300 pounds and he, and he, and he nudged me back a few feet. So I think, I think he was uh, one of the top, top running backs in the AFC. Jackson and I. Here's Marino, give off to Stratford into the middle, he goes, touchdown for Troy Stratford. What does he hit that ball quick? Reminds me so much of Gale Sayer, years gone by for the Chicago Bears. Stratford became only the second Miami player to lead the team in rushing and receiving in the same season. He won the affection of the fans and was the heart of the running attack, which also featured fullbacks Woody Bennett and Ron Davenport, number 30. Lorenzo Hampton was the team's second leading rusher. In 
1987, the Miami Brown game approached Shula's expectations for a more balanced offensive attack. You have to have some kind of a running game, but you get caught in that dilemma that you can't spend too much time with a running game because you're taking the ball out of Marino's hand. He's a fighter. He might go out one series and, and, and throw interception, okay? And uh, he'll come right back and throw a touchdown. And that, that's probably the thing that really sticks out in my mind that makes him one of the elite quarterbacks in the league. He doesn't crack. You know, he doesn't break. He might crack a little bit. You might beat him here, but I think he'll win the, uh, he'll win the war. Wars are won in the trenches, and Marino's success was tied to his impenetrable wall of blockers. The anchor was six-time Pro Bowl center Dwight Stevenson, along with guards Roy Foster and Tom Toth, tackles John Giesler and Ronnie Lee, reliable backup Jeff Dellenbach, and promising rookies Chris Conlon and Mark Dennis. The line provided Marino with the league's finest pass protection. With the surge of the ground attack, the line proved to be equally adept at run blocking, bursting open holes for Troy Stratford and company. Despite an injury to Dwight Stevenson, who is expected back early next year, the offensive line surrendered only 13 sacks, the fewest allowed for a league record sixth consecutive season. Another reason the NFL's all-time leading passer is sacked so infrequently is due to his quick trigger, the fastest release in the game. There are a lot of quarterbacks, if you can just get in their face and just put pressure on them or just get a hit on them or something like that, then you're doing your job. Against Marino, that's not enough. Yet a quarterback is only as good as his supporting cast. With a quarterback like Marino, you try to surround him with as many offensive weapons as you can possibly find, as receivers, as running backs that can catch the football, as a tight end that can get downfield and catch the football. And that's going to make Marino that much more effective. Tight ends Bruce Hardy, Dan Johnson, and all-purpose backup Jim Jensen are short-yarded specialists who complement receivers like James Pruitt, number 82. Fred Banks, number 86, was a capable backup at wideout. Marino's prime targets remain the Marx Brothers, arguably the finest receiving tandem in the game. Mark Duper raced for a team-high eight touchdowns, while his counterpart was one behind with seven. But Clayton had the better year in terms of yardage and consistency. The dynamic passing attack of the Miami Dolphins, it all starts with Dan Marino, the most electrifying performer in the NFL today. The 1987 season hit rock bottom in Buffalo as the Dolphins were humiliated 27 to nothing. The lone bright spot was provided by punter Reggie Roby, who nailed a team record 77 yard punt, tied for the season's longest. Despite missing several games with injuries, Roby averaged over 42 yards a punt. Kicker Fouad Reves finished as the team's leading scorer and was perfect from inside the 40-yard line. Special teams coach Mike Westoff, along with strength and conditioning assistant Junior Wade, relied on bomb squad specialists such as Renee Thompson, Clifford Hobley, and Woody Bennett, number 34. Rookie Rick Graff made his impact on special teams before becoming a starter at linebacker in the 13th week of the season against the Jets. Coincidentally, that game against division rival New York marked the beginning of a three-game stretch in which Miami would play its best ball of the season. Under the lights on Monday night, Miami put on a primetime spectacle worthy of an Emmy, and the leading man was Troy Stratford, who notched his third 100-yard game. Brilliant runs are expected of Stratford, but a bootleg by Marino is a rare sight. Marino, play fakes, he's going to run it in for a touchdown. <laughs> Today, Dan Marino runs. What's next? What's next, unfortunately for the Jets, was a resurgence of the Dolphin defense, led by Paul Lankford's timely interception. 
The pass rush came alive in this 37 to 28 victory, and John Bosa's pension for the big play on defense carried over the following week in Philadelphia as the Dolphins recorded four sacks for the second straight game. A dynamic offense is what the fans expect to see from Miami, and Dan Marino did not disappoint, throwing a trio of touchdown passes, including two to Mark Clayton, as the Dolphins dominated in their most impressive win of the season, 28 to 10. Backs are split, Marino wants to throw it, goes a lot pass, Clayton, he's got it! Did he get in? He did for a touchdown! Mark Clayton was the hero in Philadelphia, but the next week against Washington, it would take everything Dan Marino could muster to beat the future world champions. This time, his favorite target was the other Mark, Mark Duper, who broke out of his receiving slump with a vengeance. through for a season best 393 yards 170 of which went to duper but their heroics couldn't prevent Washington from taking the lead late in the game twice before the Dolphins had to rally and they turned to Mark duper they called on him once more with victory on the line you know when the shotgun fades to throw goes for the corner of the end zone Touchdown by Mark Duper. What a catch. What a play. Mark Duper, our offensive player of the game. With victory in hand against Washington, uncontained joy swept through Joe Robbie Stadium. In 1987, the Dolphins alternated between unmatched excellence and unsettling inconsistency. But Don Shula's leadership and ability to blend seasoned veterans with upstart youngsters gives the Dolphins the foundation for a bright future.